so that the gulf of sin is buffered by priesthood. Hallelujah. Because God is holy. It is impossible for him to interact with unholy people. So there is a bridge, if you will, between the uh, fallen man and the holy God. And that bridge is the priesthood. Hallelujah. So let us look at the priesthood and its dispensation. First, look at priesthood under the law. See, the law appointed priests by bloodline. And we know this from looking at Numbers chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. And then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to bring the uh, 12 wooden staffs, one from each leader of Israel's ancestral tribe, and inscribe each leader's name on the staff. Inscribe Aaron's name on the staff of the tribe of Levi, for there must be one staff for the leader of each ancestral tribe. Place these staffs in the tabernacle in front of the ark containing the tablets of the covenant where I meet with you. Verse five, buds will sprout on the staff belonging to the man that I choose. Then I will finally put an end to the people's murmurings and complaints against you. So Moses gave instructions to the people of Israel each of the 12 tribal leaders, including Aaron, brought Moses a staff. Moses placed the staffs in the Lord's presence in the tabernacle of the covenant. And when he went into the tabernacle of the covenant the next day, he found that Aaron's staff, representing the tribe of Levi, had sprouted and budded and blossomed and produced ripe almonds. Hallelujah. This was the miraculous demonstration of God's choice of the uh, Levitical tribe, the, the Levit Levitical priesthood. This is how it began that the priests were named from the house of Levi. Levi. So according to Numbers 20, 28, there was the office of the high priest, who is the head of all the priests, was transmitted upon death to the oldest living son of the high priest. So long as he was without blemish, there were certain conditions. He had to be spotless. He had to be without defect. He had to be without blemish. Moses removed Aaron's garments and put them on his son, Eleazar. And Aaron died there on the top of the mountain. And then Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain. And according to Numbers 25, verses 10 through 13, God made a covenant with Phinehas the eldest son of Eleazar, which guaranteed a lasting priesthood with the Aaronic line. So priesthood, according to the law, the commandment, was appointed by bloodline. And there was a primogeniture inheritance, which means that the first eldest son of the priest, upon the death of the high priest, also became the high priest so long as he was without blemish. And we see the illustration here of Aaron's eldest son, Eleazar, becoming, succeeding him as high priest, and Phinehas succeeding Eleazar, you know, as a high priest. So that was the way that priesthood, you know, these intermediaries, these people that stood between the people and God was established under the law. Now, there was a radical change when grace came, when Jesus came. And to these, we turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verses 22 to, of 20 to 22. In the New Living Translations, it says this, this new system was established with a solemn oath. Now, here's a difference. Aaron's descendants became priests without such an oath. God did not swear an oath. He just mainly chose but there was an oath regarding Jesus. For God said of him, the Lord has taken an oath and he will not break his vow. You are a priest forever. And verse 22, because of this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees this better covenant with God. You know, so what is this distinction between the oath and the forever covenant 
compared to the Lord's appointing of the priesthood. You know, in the time, in the olden times, the priests were conditioned to be priests for as long as they were holy, for as long as they were righteous. You see, so in the time of, of Jesus Christ, righteousness was a foregone conclusion and the priesthood was established with a solemn oath forever. So that is the distinction. Remember, we're talking today about the permanent priesthood. Now, I want to spend some time in the office of the high priest, you know, and with regard to this uh, kernel, the essence of his role, which was the sin offering. Hallelujah. Now, Leviticus chapter 16 in his entirety do, deals with the principal duty of the high priest. It was to officiate on the day of atonement. And, you know, those who are observant Jews just celebrated Yom Kippur, which is the day of atonement. Once a year, the high priest was to come before God in his presence in the holy, holies of holies and make a, the, an atonement first for, his, for himself and his uh, immediate family and next for the entire nation. Now, on this day of atonement, the high priest dressed in ceremonial garments, you know, and, and in linen garments and with specific instructions about how he had to purify himself, bathe himself in order to come before the presence of God. Now, when he entered the tabernacle or later the temple, once it was built, he was sprinkled over the top of the mercy seat, the blood of the bullock of the sin offering that he sacrificed for himself. Remember, he had to sacrifice for himself a sin offering before going back again for the people. So after he came forth from the Holy of Holies, he again entered and sprinkled the blood of the goat, not the bullock this time, the goat, of the sin offering for the people. Both times he emerged from the Holy of Holies, a pardon for his personal sin and a pardon for the sins of the people. In each instance, the pardon was based solely on the blood of the sin offering, which represented a type of Christ on the cross. See, the sin offering was good for a little season. It wasn't a forever thing. And that is why it was mandated to be an annual event. You know, it was good for a season. Now the sin offering, just to uh, spend a little more time, uh, had the notion of um, a temporary forgiveness. It did two things. One, it forgave or brought forgiveness to the sins of the people for, for a little while. And then the scapegoat, because there were two goats that were offered. One was slaughtered for sin offering. The blood was sprinkled. The other was, le was left alive. And what Aaron did was that when this goat, and it had to be lot, they had to cast lots to choose which one was going to be the scapegoat and which one was going to be uh, the sin offering. Now the scapegoat, Aaron, the high priest, will put his hands upon the head of this, of this goat, and then he will confess the sins of the people and the iniquities of the people upon this lamb, this goat. And then someone was appointed and would take this goat out into the wilderness and an in uninhabited terrain. And it would let loose this goat and the goat will wander away representing the sins of the people. And it was left alive to wander. Now this is mysterious again, uh, we're dealing with a subject here that isn't culturally uh, 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 relevant to us now because it is difficult to understand unless we perceive the holiness of God and that the standard of holiness needed to have a way to uh, interact with people who didn't possess the righteousness. You know, so annually, the scapegoat had to be released. The sin offering had to be uh, performed in order to cleanse the people and bring them back in right standing with God. Hallelujah. Now, God always knew that this was a temporary measure. You know, so this annual designation was in Leviticus 
again, the 16th chapter, 32 and 34, it says this, in future generations, the purification ceremony will be performed by the priest who has been appointed, had been anointed and ordained to serve as high priest in place of his ancestor Aaron. He will put on the holy linen garments, verse 33, and purify the most holy place, the tabernacle and the altar, the priest and the entire congregation. Verse 34, and this is key. This is a permanent law for you to purify the people of Israel from their sins, making them right with the Lord once each year. So this was a prescription, an annual prescription that had to be repeated on the same day of the seventh, seventh month of the year, once each year. Now, I won't go into all the uh, rites and rituals. There were very specific orders for purification. There were specific orders of how many times, seven times that the blood had to be sprinkled towards the cover of atonement. There were specific directions on how to move and how to do every single thing. And the Bible tells us here that Moses followed all of these instructions exactly as the Lord had commanded him. Now, remember, if any of this seems strange to you, think of the holiness of God. God is so holy, it is impossible for him to dwell with sin, to cohabit with sin. So in order for us to have a way or pathway to him, all of these ceremonial rituals and rites were put in place for appeasement, you know, for atonement, to bring us a temporary respite. But God knew better. He wasn't going to be doing this annually, and, and the blood of animals were good for one thing, but he always had in his mind the eternal priesthood. Hallelujah. Now, we are told in Hebrews chapter 7, from verse, verses 1 through 3, that Melchizedek was a king of Salem and a priest of God most high. There is an account in the book of Genesis where he met, Melchizedek that is, met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings of Salem and blessed him. And verse two, and Abraham gave him a tenth, which is a tithe of everything. Now, first, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem, which means king of peace. Melchizedek is without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of days. And Melchizedek is a theophany which represents the, the son of God. He remains a priest forever. So why are we uh, reading of this account? We're re reading of this account because we know that we serve a God who does not repent, a God who knows yesterday, he knows tomorrow, he knows everything that will happen. So he fully intended for the priesthood to be eternal. And that is why we are shown Melchizedek as a type of priest, not the one that was instituted by the law, which we now know is temporary. Amen? Hebrews chapter 7, as we go down to verses 23 to 28, you know, ties this in. It says, now there have been many of those priests, those priests that were attended by the law, appointed by the law, since death prevented them from continuing in the office. And because Jesus, in opposition to those who uh, uh, were stopped by death, lives forever. He has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Now, when we talk about Christ, we say he's seated at the right hand of God the Father and that he is an eternal advocate, you know, advocating for our sins. Hallelujah. Verse 26. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, one who is blameless, one who is pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Verse 27, unlike the other high priest, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, 
first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once and for all when he offered himself up on that cross on Calvary. For the law appoints as high priest men in all their weakness, but the oath, and here's the distinction, the law appoints, but the oath which came after the law appointed the son who has now been made perfect forever. He has been glorified. He's our eternal priest. He's our eternal high priest. And he has paid the price once and for all. And no longer do we need to make the uh, temporary sacrifices of animals. No longer do we need to take a scapegoat and leave it to run into the wilderness. No longer are we required to make all this temporary atonement as we abide in Christ. Our atonement is continual. It is forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. So to seal this, there remains a, uh, a discussion, which is the union. See, the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 5, that there's only one mediator between God and man. And that mediator is the Lord Jesus Christ. So remember, the appointment of the priest was to serve as a breach between those who are unholy and the holy God. Now, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 uh, tells us, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Remember Exodus 19, 5 and 6? Sounds just alike. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession that you may be that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Verse 10, once you were not a people, speaking of the Gentiles, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Hallelujah. So there is a union that occurs when we make the Lord Jesus our Lord and personal Savior, we become a part of the royal priesthood, a peculiar people, a holy nation, and we are called into this union of permanent priesthood. That is our conduit. That is our channel to access in the throne room of grace and to reaching out to the almighty God. See, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the, the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, within the context of this statement, the apostle Peter was saying that he rests the identity of the church, the believers, the body of Christ, as a royal priesthood in their union with Christ. How are you a royal priesthood? You are a royal priesthood by your adoption into the uh, joint inheritance with Christ. Because of the shed blood of Christ on Calvary, you are imputed with the righteousness of Christ. And God no longer sees you as unholy. You are now declared and justified holy. You have come to the living stone that was rejected by men and chosen and precious in the sight of God. As such, we, the believers who come onto this union, have become ourselves living stones to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices, no longer animal sacrifices, no longer the blood of bullocks, goats, and, and lambs and such, or, or, you know, but we are able to offer spiritual sacrifices in the form of fasting, in the form of prayer and fasting. And these sacrifices are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And to seal this completely, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, tells us that our priestly office finds its found, its source in the Christ, in the priestly office, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there is a connection, there is a union. Our royal priesthood is linked to the eternal priesthood of Jesus Christ. So you see the plan is clear. Jesus is the way, he is the door, he is the way, the truth and the life. And no man can come to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Now one other thing that he passed on to us is because the 
righteousness of Christ has been imputed to all believers, all we need to do is to declare our faith, hold true to the faith that Jesus Christ has shared with us, and we are seen as righteous. We are no longer in sin. We're, we're no longer enslaved to sin. We're no longer a burden to sin. We no longer carry that burden because we have not only been justified, we have also been sanctified. You see, sanctification is the pruning process, is the process of achieving perfection. It is the process where Christ brings, you know, that Christ bequeaths to all his believers, where we are all set apart and made holy and made holy into the image and the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So one bears to ask the question, do we still need priests today? Do we still need people who are appointed, you know, to serve in our stead? You know, that question is a controversial one that many believers struggle with. Now, in the uh, Pentecostal church, the priest today is the pastor. Does it mean that we no longer need leaders or pastors or people who are attended who are appointed to the church? Clearly not. Clearly not. The need is always there because the, the, the Bible tells us at the foundation of the church that many are appointed into different offices. We know that some are called to be apostles, some are called to be teachers, prophets, workers of miracles. You know, different offices, prophets, you know, so as long as these prophets, these offices exist, there is need for those who are bequeathed with those gifts. And the person who dispenses this gift is the Holy Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Now, if I'm talking to you and this is all alien and foreign and you have never made the Lord Jesus Christ your Lord and personal Savior, let me give you an opportunity to do so. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 tells us, for if you tell others with your own mouth, that Jesus Christ is your Lord and, and believe in your own heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So we're going to pray a prayer now. Now, whether you're praying this prayer simultaneously or you're listening to this broadcast at a later date, this promise endures. The only prerequisites is that you believe in your heart and that you truly repent. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I pray for your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and I invite you to come into my heart and life today. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. Friends, praise God. We thank God. If you've just prayed that prayer for the first time, welcome to the kingdom of God. Now, the adversary of your soul is a wily character. He will not let you think that the victory is over. In fact, he will come after you and tell you nothing's changed. So I want to leave you with three quick instructions of how to maintain your present state. See, three things you must do. One, talk to God every day. Christians call that prayer. Now you say, Pastor, what do I talk to God about? Talk to him about the things that, that ail you, the, the, the needs you have in your life, your dreams, everything that you care about. Talk to God. We call that prayer. And number two, read the Bible every day. God talks to you through his word. You say, how? God will speak to you through his revelation knowledge. He will send you messages. You will understand the solutions to mysteries, and you yourself, as you continue in your relationship with God, will become a conduit, the channel through whom God will bless others. Hallelujah. Now, number three, join a Bible-believing church, and you will grow and mature into the purpose of God's calling in your life. You have a standing invitation to Grace Gate Church. We'll welcome you to join us anytime. And we pray that God will appoint your ways, for we believe that the path of the righteous are ordered of God. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. I want to thank God for this message of permanent priesthood as we understand why God instituted the office of the priesthood and the office of the high priest and the law under the dispensation of the law made this an annual event. It was temporary, but deep inside, we see that even from the beginning, the type of eternal priesthood of Melchizedek 
existed in Genesis. And God perfected the type when Christ took on the oath after he had paid the price on Calvary and went on you know, to be our intercessor at the right hand of God the Father. He is an eternal and permanent priest. And we, more importantly, are united with him in this effort as we are now called a royal priesthood, a holy nation of peculiar people. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you.